we are going to be talking about the Right Start Mathematics program and the AL Abacus. I am Kathleen Lawler, and if you notice, it also says Kathleen Cotter Lawler because Dr. Cotter is my mother. So we're, this is going to be based on the work of Dr. Cotter. This is me. Now you can put a name and a face together. All right, let's go ahead and get started. What is an abacus? An abacus is beads on a frame. It does not tell you how many, what size, and they vary greatly. The AL abacus has the beads grouped in fives and tens. Ours is the only one in the world that is double-sided. We use both the front and the back of our abacus. So let's look at the front side first. What is the abacus? It is a visual and tactile manipulative. So we're able to see and we're able to touch. It develops a mental image of quantities. Because of the blue and yellow beads, you can see eight because you have five of one color and three of another. It helps develop mental images of strategies. It also helps develop mental images of mathematical operations. So let's start with quantities on fingers. Let's take a little one, and sometimes they're not so little, depending upon what the children know, and ask a child, how many is two? Most kids can hold up two. Show me four. Show me five. That's all the fingers. When we start to get into multiple or more than five, obviously you're going to be using two hands. Here's seven. It's five and two more. And ten. All the fingers. Now, what we do, and this is a cultural thing, a lot of times we have the children count. Count for mommy, count for daddy, count for grandma. And we want them to count and say, show me that there's four. One, two, three, four. But here's the problem with counting this way. When we count, we see one, two, three, four. Four indicating the full quantity. But what happens when a child does it is they see, here's number one. Here's number two. This is just naming this stick as two. It has nothing to do with this one. Here's three. Here's four. They're not seeing four as the full quantity. They're seeing four as its name. So think of it, for example, if I were to, if I were to name all the children in the family, John, Anna, Maggie, Matt, Matt does not include the other three children. He's enough by himself. And so from a child's point of view, number four is the name of this stick. It's not the full quantity of all four sticks. That's what counting, that's the image that counting can create in some children. So we don't want them to count because it can develop a misconception. Another problem, or I shouldn't say a problem, but another thing that we deal with a lot is the way our brains work. We have a tough time visualizing numbers over about six or seven. So let's try this. Let's try to visualize, or see in your mind's eye, eight apples with no grouping. So put all eight red apples lined up on your kitchen counter. Can you see that? And most people cannot. So if I were to ask you, is this eight? Some people have to put their finger right here. Okay, they group it four and four. Or maybe you group it five and three. But it's very difficult to see eight apples or eight anything unless they're grouped. Now, let me tell you that five of the apples are red and three are green. Now, can you see that on your kitchen counter? So we have five red and three green. Can you visualize that? Can you see that in your mind's eye? And yes, you can. 
This is the way our human brain works. We cannot, again, see all eight lined up. We, like our, the way our brain works, we have to see them grouped. In this case, five and three. Now, the early Romans knew that. When they had their numbers, eight was grouped. It was grouped by fives. Music is grouped. So this is the way we've always done things. Well, shouldn't we do math that way? All right, so let's start to take a little one who knows their fingers. They know how many are, you know, they, they can show you seven on their fingers. And we're going to start to make it a little bit more abstract by putting down tally sticks or popsicle sticks, craft sticks. And so here's three, four, five. And I can tell that's five. Because, oops, let me go back here. I can tell that's five because five has a middle. Four does not. But this is five. Now, the other way I can write five is I can lay that fifth tally stick over the four, indicating this is my group of five. Now, you're familiar with this. This looks like tally marks. Normally, though, when we do tally marks, we run it diagonal. Well, the reason we're not running diagonal here is First of all, the children don't like, or a lot of children don't like diagonals. They go through a phase in their life where they do not like diagonals. So lay it horizontally. The other thing is, is the tally stick doesn't reach quite as far. So here's five, seven, and ten. So we're grouping them so that we can see it. Well, now let's continue to apply this idea. But first of all, I want to talk about what is visualizing. Visualizing is forming a mental image or a vision in our mind's eye so we can imagine something. Visualizing is needed in mathematics, botany, geography, engineering, construction. All these different things use visualizing. So we're not just going to be use the using the visualizing for our math, we're going to be using it for many future skills. Can you imagine if your surgeon couldn't visualize where you left your appendix? You want them to know that. We don't want them to randomly cut until they find your appendix. So let's now look and apply this to the AL abacus. So let's start by entering quantities on the abacus. Now, at this point, the child understands and knows their numbers. So when I say, show me three, they're going to put it on their fingers, and there's the abacus, and there's the symbol that represents three. So we start with our fingers, we go to the abacus, and then we introduce the symbol that means three. Let's do another one here. Let's show seven. Oh, I'm sorry, five. I thought it was seven. Let's show five. So it's all my fingers. And here's five. And this is how we write five. This is the symbol for five. Let's do seven. There's seven. Seven. And you see how that correlates. Now, one other thing I want you to notice, this child here, my little fictitious person, is using their left hand for the fives and the right hand for anything above five. Why do we do it from left to right? And the reason is, is because first of all, we read from left to right. And secondly, it aligns with the abacus. So we can see seven. And, of course, this is how we write 7. And 10. And here's the symbol 10. So now that the child understands all the quantities, let's go and start to look how they're related. Now, in this case, I can see I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. What this is doing is allowing the child to count meaningfully. So they can see one, two, three. Three means all of these. Four means all of these. Five means all of these. So it's not a sequence. It means something. And they can see the relationship between the numbers. 
Let's do some simple adding. Let's start out with 4 and 3 is. Now, if you notice, I didn't say plus and I did not say equals. When I'm doing working with a very little one, I want to say 4 and 3 is. And as they get older, and I don't mean necessarily older physically, but they're older, they're ready for this, I would say the other word, the math word for and is plus, and the math word for equals, or excuse me, for is, is equals. So we're going to start out with 4 and 3 is, when I say is, I push it together, is, oh, I've seen that number before, that's 7. And there's 7. Yet, this is what typical worksheets look like. So when we say 4 plus 3 is, the children just have an exercise in counting horses. It doesn't tell them what the answer is. Here's a look at how the facts equal 10. So here's 1 and 9, 2 and 8, 3 and 7, all the way down. So you can see how they all, how the numbers work together. And what we want to do is we want to have the children play games to practice what they're learning. So the first game that we're going to have them play is a go to the dump type of game. Go to the dump is a spin-off of go fish, where in the go fish game, we have the four and one, or excuse me, the four and four and the three and the three make pairs. But with the go to dump game, we want the pairs to be things that equal 10. So a 1 and a 9, 2 and a 7, excuse me, 2 and a 8, 3 and a 7, 4 and a 6. So we want our pairs to be things that equal 10. And we play the game the same way. What this is doing is it's going to be reinforcing what the children have learned or they're helping them to learn it. I like to say that 10 to 15 minutes of a worksheet, excuse me, 10 to 15 minutes of a game is the same thing as a worksheet. Let's look at the math way of naming the numbers. This is huge. If this is the only thing you get out of this webinar, then I have done my job. Obviously, there's more things, but this is so important. The math way of naming numbers. Children first or often think of 14 as 14 ones, not as a 10 and four ones. So what we want them to do is we want them to see the pattern that's needed to make sense of the tens and ones. But in our language, it's hidden. So when I say 14, you can't really see that it's 10 and 4 more. So what we have the children do, and this idea comes from the Asian cultures, when we say 20, we're going to say 210. 21 is 210 one. 210 2, 210 3, 210 4, all the way down, 210 9, 310. Obviously, our, our, you know, our teen numbers are going to be 11. 11 is going to be 10 1, 10 2, 10 3, 10 4. Now, why in the world are we doing this? Well, just think about this. And you compare this to the alphabet. Just because you can recite the alphabet, it doesn't mean that you can read. So if I say A, B, C, D, E, F, G, it doesn't help me reading. So same thing with counting, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. It doesn't really teach me how the numbers go together. So what we do with reading is we teach the children the sound, A, B, K, D. So we teach them the name of the quantity, the math way of saying the numbers. So I would say 210, 2, 210, 3, 210, 4. Asian children, like I said, use the math way of saying their numbers. And the Asian children understand place value in first grade, whereas only half of the U.S. students understand place value at the end of fourth grade. And those of you that have fifth graders, let me tell you, we're not teaching that in fifth grade. So the children need to understand this. But think about it. If I go back and I say 3106, how many tens are in 310, wink, wink, 6? 
Well, you can hear it. You can, you can, it, it's right there, three, ten, six. That's like saying, what's your name, Bob? They can hear it. So that is the important thing of the math way of saying the numbers. The other thing, too, is mathematics is a science of patterns. And the pattern math way of saying the numbers, and we just do it for a few months, helps them understand the place value and the patterns. You can hear the pattern if I say 310, 6, 310, 7, 310, 8, 310, 9, 410, 410, 1, 410, 2. Again, there's a pattern in there. Now, the children, our kindergartners, will do it for about six months. Our first graders do it for about three months. And those that are a little bit older will only do it for about a week. And that's it. Now, when Dr. Cotter was working with this, when Dr. Cotter was working with this, she had two groups of students. She had one group that understood the traditional way of saying the numbers and the other group that understood the math way of saying the numbers. And she asked both groups to construct 48. So both groups were able to construct 48. And need, none of them had ever seen any kind of rods like this. Everybody did good. Then she had those, they, and she had everybody subtract 14. So the traditional group subtracted 14, provided they could count accurately, they got the answer. And of course, there were some that had errors. Then she asked the group that understood the math way of saying the numbers, and she had them subtract 14. Well, they knew 14 was 1104. And so when they pulled it off, let me go back here, when they did 1, 10, 4, they all got the answer right, including a young little boy who had had a lot of disability or a lot of uh, situations and, and had some learning disabilities. Even he could do this. They understand what 14 means. It's 1, 10, 4. Here's looking at the place value on the abacus. Here's 210, 110, 210. So you can see the 210. Up here, these are our place value cards. Here is 210. So we're working with our syllables also, 210. Here's 310, 310. Now, if I were to add a 7 on my next row, there's 7. Here's my place value card that represents 7. And the way I write it is I put it on top. So if I become confused and wonder, what does that 3 mean? I can lift the 7 off. Oh, that's right. That was 310 and 7 more. 310, 7. Here's 610. 610, 2. And when I put the 2 on top, I have 610, 2. 10 tens. 10 tens. Again, I'm using my syllables. Also known as, you're going to love this, 100. Here's 200, two abacuses laying on the side. 10 hundred. Ten hundred, also known as, this one's not quite as nice, one thousand. So here's my place value cards, three ten, three hundred, and three thousand. Here's my numbers all lined up. So if I were to build three thousand six hundred five ten eight. Here's all the pieces I'm going to need. I build them, and this is what it looks like when I'm done. And again, if I would get confused and I'd forget, what does this 6 mean? I can pull it apart. Oh, that's right. That's 600. Here's the number 3,008. Now, some of you are wondering, okay, I've got these kids saying the number's really goofy. Let's figure out, let me show you how to 
teach them the traditional way of saying the numbers. So let's look at 410. It's also called 4T. So another word for 10 is T. So 410 is 4T. 610 is also 6T. 810, 8T. Now, to do the teens, let's do a, a word game. And I'm going to do the first one. I'm going to say fireplace. And I'm going to flip it around and say place fire. Next one, newspaper would be paper news. Box mail, flip it around, would become mailbox. We want the children to get used to the idea of flipping it around because we are going to now apply that to the teens. So I have 10, 4 on here. So I have 10, 4. Now another name for 10 is teen. So I could say teen, 4. And now I'm going to flip it and say 14. That wasn't so bad. Let's do another one real quick. Let's do 10, 7. So I have 10, 7. The other name for 10 is teen, teen, 7. And now I flip it and end up with 17. Okay, well, what about those peskies 11 and 12? It doesn't apply here. Well, back in the Middle Ages, when they were trying to figure out what the name for this number would be, they said it's 10 and one left over. And they shortened it and started calling it a one left. A one left, flipping it around, becomes a left one. And over time, it blurred and became 11. So a one left, a left one, 11. Similar thing happened with two. So we have 10, 2, and in this case, there are two left over. But back then, they pronounced the W in 2. So it was 2-woo, left. And that blurred and became 12. And that's a true story. A strategy is an efficient way to learn a new fact or, more importantly in my opinion, to recall a forgotten fact. And if we can make it a visual representation, we can see it in our mind's eye, that's a very powerful strategy. So let's look on the abacus. We're going to do our first strategy called Complete the Ten. Now you guys have told the children, add nine to a number, it's the same thing as adding ten to the same number, minus one, blah, blah, blah. And, and the kids don't get it. So let's show them. Let's do nine on the first row and five on the next. So I have nine plus five. And what I want to do in this strategy is I want to complete the 10. So I'm going to trade this bead here on the top row with this bead here on the next row and do one, two, three, trade. And now I have 10, four, or 14. Let's do another one. Let's do 9 plus 7. 9 on the first row, 7 on the next. I'm going to complete my 10, so I'm going to trade these two beads. 1, 2, 3, trade. And my answer is 10, 6, or 16. Let's do another strategy. This one is called the 2 fives strategy. 8 plus 6. We're going to put 8 on the first row, 6 on the next. And before I do anything, can anyone see the answer? Look at how many blue beads I have. I have two fives, or 10. And how many left over? 4. So 8 plus 6 is 1, 10, 4, or 14. This is my personal favorite. Let's do another one here. Let's do seven plus five. Seven on the first row, five on the next. 
Look at that, you can see the answer. The answer is 10 and two more. There's 10 blue beads, two more. My answer is 12. Let's look another strategy here on subtracting. First of all, I want to insert a comment. If Dr. Cotter had it her way, she would have addition taught first, then multiplication, come back to subtraction, and finish with division. The reason is, is because addition and subtraction are mirror images of each other. And a lot of times when you're doing addition, you're really doing subtraction. When you're doing subtraction, you're doing addition, it gets very messy. So what we like to do in the curriculum is we are very heavy on addition. The children are doing the subtraction. We're just not calling it that. We use part whole circle sets and, and subtraction is used. So just a, a note for you that, that subtraction can be very confusing and a division if, if you're putting it back to back with their counterparts. Okay, let's do a strategy here called uh, subtracting by going down. So in this case, I have 1, 10, 5, 15, minus 9. So I'm going to put on my 15, my 1, 10, 5, and then subtract the 9 by taking it off the second row and then the first row. And my answer is, not surprisingly, 6. Now let's do it again. Let's do another one. Let's do 15 minus 9 again. 15. But this time I'm going to take the 9 all off the first row. So as I take it off, the answer is amazing. It's still 6. So we want to show the children there's multiple ways to solve the same problem. So if I have 15 minus 9, I can do it different ways depending upon what situation I'm in. We'll teach them one way on Monday, a second way on Tuesday, and a third way on Wednesday. Not because we're trying to confuse them, but because we're trying to give them as many tools as they need in their tool belt to figure things out. So let me show you another way of doing subtraction. We call this one subtracting by going up. So we start with the 9, and what do I need to go up to 13? So here's 9, I need to go up to 1, 10, 3, I need 4 more beads. 13 minus 9 is 4. Now, when in the world would you ever use something like that? Well, if you buy a pack of gum, it's 89 cents, you give them a dollar, what's your change? It's 11 cents. Now, did you take $1 minus 89 cents is, draw the line, borrow, carry? No, you probably went 89.90 a dollar, 11 cents. We subtracted by going up. And we're going to show this to the children. Now, some children are not going to like this. Other children are going to think this is the coolest. And again, that's why we want to show them because every child's going to be doing it differently. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Let's look at the abacus. Let's look at the second side of the abacus. Everything down to the bottom here is cleared. These first two rows are the thousands. These two are the hundreds. And now we have the tens and the ones. So let's start. By doing that, let's do a, a problem here. 8 plus 6. I'm going to put 8 beads on. Now, if you notice, I'm keeping the two lines similar. I'm keeping them as parallel as I can get them. Parallel is not the right word. Even. As even between the two rows. And I'll show you why in a minute. And ironically, kids never ask the question. It's always parents that ask this question. Okay, but let's do 8. We have 4 and 4. 8 plus 6 equals, and I put it together, and I can see that I have 10 and 4 more. I have 1, 10, 4, 14. Now I can trade these 10 beads for these beads that represent 10. It's an even trade. One represents 10, the other is 10, so it's an even trade. 
and my answer is still 1104. Little side note, remember, this is why this math way of saying the numbers is so critical. It becomes so useful, becomes so obvious. Here's 1104. Now, back to my question, why did I say that I want to keep the two columns even? Well, let's just say I put on 8 plus 3, not keeping them equal. Is it easy to see the answer? And no, it's not. You can't tell as easily here if we're over 10. So that's why we try to keep the two columns as even as possible because the color will indicate when we are over 10. Let's do a card game and let's practice this trading that we did. So we're going to start out by a card. We're flipping it over. We see a 7 and I put on 7 beads. Next card is a 6 and I put the 6 on. Am I over 10? And the answer is yes. So I'm going to trade these 10 beads for this bead that represents 10. Now I'm not looking to know that 7 plus 6 is 13. What I'm looking for is to see just the experience. I'm trying. I'm wanting to experience the bead trading. So let's do another card. 9. I scoot nine beads up. I'm over 10, so I'm going to trade these 10 beads for this bead that represents 10 and continue from here. And this is the kind of game that the kids just love. It also gives them an idea as to what the trading means and also it helps them understand how the numbers work. So it, it, it gives shows them the pattern through going all the way up to the thousands. <coughs> Excuse me. It helps a child experience the greater value of each column. So we want them to have to sh see the never-ending pattern of trading. So they're going to trade the 10 ones for 110, 10 10s for 100, and 10 hundreds for 1000. Okay, so let's apply our new trading skills. And let's add a four-digit number. So we're going to take 3,600, 5, 10, 8. And I'm going to add, as traditionally, starting with the ones. So I'm going to start with the next 8 and put up 8 beads. Am I over 10? Yes. So I'm going to trade these 10 for this 110 bead. Oops, there's the 110. And trade. Now here I'm going to do something a little bit different because I want to stop and record what I've done so far. So how many ones do I have? I have six. And what else did I do? Oh, that's right. I gave myself a 10, which I'm very cleverly going to be putting right up here. Okay, let's continue. Now I'm going to add my 310 <coughs> and put the 310 beads on. Do I need to trade? No. So how many 10s do I need? Do I have there now? I have 910. Did I do anything else? No. So now I'm going to add the 700. There's my 700. Do I need to trade? Yes. So I'm going to trade these 10 hundreds for this bead that represents 1,000. It's an even trade. And stop and record. How many hundreds do I have? I have three. And what else did I do? I gave myself 1,000. And let's add the last 2,000. Put them on and record. So my answer now is 6,309.10.6. Now the children will do these activities for probably about two to three days. And they'll only do 12 or 13 problems but they're, it, because it takes a while to do it. But they're learning it. 
Most children who learn to add on the AL abacus transition to the paper and pencil algorithm without further instruction because they understand why they're doing this. When I have two numbers, where do I put the extra? I put it up here. Let's look at multiplying on the abacus. Here's six times four. Here's six taken four times. You can see that you have a ten, two ten, and four more. Let me go back here so you can see my answer is 24. 10, 2, 10, 4, 24. Here's 5 times 7. 5, 7 times. It's not as easy to see, so let's, let me group them for you. I have 3 fives, excuse me, sorry, my apologies, 3, 10, and 5 more. So my answer, 5 times 7 is 35. 7 times 7. Whoa, a lot of beads. So let's group again. Now, I know that this is 25, and 10 more is 35, and 10 more is 45, and 4 more is 49. 7 times 7 is 49. Now, what happens is the child and adult Will somebody will say what seven times seven? Oh, I don't know what the answer is. And then they'll think of the abacus and they'll be able to see it in their mind's eye. And oh, there, there's the answer. Seven times seven. They can see the answer because they know how it works. Nine times three. It's the same thing as how many beads are there all together? There's 30 all together in these three rows. Minus three leaves us with 27. So here's 9 times 3, and if I turn the abacus 90 degrees, is the same thing as 3, here's 3, 9 times. So 1 time, 2 time, 3 time. It's the same thing. How many times have you told the children that, well, if you know 3 times 9, 9 times 3 is the same, and they look at you and go, I don't know. Well, here you can show it to them that it is the same thing. A renowned math educator in England in 1982 says it is now a well-established fact that those who are mathematically effective in their daily life seldom make use in their heads of the standard written methods that are taught in the classroom. So if the good math people are not doing the way that is they're traditionally been taught, why do we want to continue to teach them? Shouldn't we teach them the way that the good math people are learning. And that's one thing I think is very important to remind everybody that Dr. Cotter is an electrical engineer, so she knows how math is applied. She is a certified Montessori teacher, so she knows how the little ones think. She has her master's degree in curriculum instruction. She taught grades six, seven, and eight and said, these guys are idiots, not because they're stupid, but you can't be doing higher level math if you don't have your basics in place. And then she has her PhD in mathematics education with an emphasis on brain research. So she knows how the brain works and why, and we, she knows what they need to learn. And so this Right Start program and the abacus and the things that she uses is phenomenal. It's the way the good math people are thinking. So what is the AL abacus? It's a visual and tactile manipulative. It helps develop mental images for quantities. I can see what three means. Strategies, for example, the two fives strategy. Helps us with our mathematical operations. I know what seven times seven means now. You can incorporate the AL abacus into your current program by using the activities for the AL Abacus book. This book is like an encyclopedia and you can go in and see what particular topic you need. So for example, subtracting from 11 on page 64 and go to that page and it will show you how to do it with the Abacus. This is perfect for those who are in another program and want to just incorporate this in. This teaches arithmetic, addition, subtraction, multiplication, 
and division using the abacus. There's also the Right Start Mathematics program that's a full curriculum. And what this is, is lesson plans that will tell you what to do, how to do it, what day to do it, and it'll work it way through. This is a full math curriculum. The other one was just arithmetic, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. This is everything that needs to be taught in math is in here. So first of all, it has the objective. In this case, it's to learn and practice the 2 five strategy or to make patterns on the GeoBoard. Now, if you notice, it's saying to learn and practice. It's not saying to master. So there's going to be errors, and that's fine. Tells me the materials I need for the day. It gives me the warm-ups. When there's something that we want you to specifically say, it will be underlined. So, for example, five, 7 is 5 plus what? And we're going to give you the answer. If you're having a rough day, it's 2. 9 is 5 plus what? Again, the answer is four. Then we have the activities. If there's a game to play, we will tell you. So this is how the Right Start Mathematics lesson plans are laid out. You can purchase them either in kits or we have deluxe kits which have more things. You don't necessarily need things in the deluxe kit, but sometimes, boy, they're nice to have. We have levels A, B, C, D, E, and the geometric, which is our middle school program. Once you're done with the geometric, you are ready to start algebra. In conclusion, math needs to be taught, so 95% is understood and 5% memorized.